Today, we're jumping into a really interesting research paper. It details a volatility trading system design, focusing quite a bit on scaling risk management. Yeah, it's about understanding the how and the why. We're not just describing strategies. We're looking at the theory, the implementation, the results, and definitely the potential downsides. Good, because understanding the risks is crucial. So the paper focuses on two main strategies. That's right. First, a straddle long short strategy, and second, a filtered approach to selling out of the money puts. We'll break down both. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. All right, let's tackle that first one. The straddle long short strategy. What's the core idea there? Okay, so the basic concept is trying to profit by anticipating changes in stock volatility, specifically within the SP 500. And they do this by looking at the implied volatility term structure. Precisely. They go long straddles on stocks where that term structure is sloping upwards, and they short straddles where it's flat or sloping downwards. Okay, maybe we should quickly define a few terms. Options first. A call is the right to buy, a put is the right to sell. Simple enough. Right, and a straddle. That's when you either buy both a call and a put, or you sell both a call and a put. Same stock, same strike price, same expiration date. So buying a straddle going long, that's a bet on volatility increasing, right? You want a big price move, doesn't matter which way. Exactly. And selling a straddle going short is the opposite. You're betting things stay pretty calm, that volatility will decrease or remain stable. Got it. Now, back to that term structure you mentioned. Implied volatility itself is what the market thinks future volatility will be. Mm -hmm. It's derived from option prices, distinct from historical volatility, which is just what happened in the past. The term structure plots this implied volatility against different expiration dates for a given stock. So an upward slope means the market expects higher volatility further out in the future. Generally, yes. And a downward slope suggests expectations for lower volatility further out or perhaps elevated near-term volatility. What's the economic thinking behind using this slope? Why would it predict anything? Well, the hypothesis in the paper is that this slope reflects market sentiment or maybe potential mispricings. The idea is during quiet times, investors might get complacent, underestimate near-term risk. Leading to that upward slope where short-term straddles might be relatively cheap. Could be. And conversely, after a big shock, maybe there's an overreaction, pushing near-term implied volatility way up, creating a downward slope. In that case, near-term straddles might become relatively expensive. So the strategy is betting that these perceived under or overreactions will correct themselves. That's the core bet, yeah. Exploiting these potential mispricings linked to the term structure slope. Okay, so how did they actually implement this? What were the steps? They used options data for SP500 stocks. Makes sense for liquidity. Then, the day after the standard monthly option expiration, they calculate that implied volatility term structure sloped the IETS for every stock. Right. Then rank them. Yep. Rank them all by the slope and split them into 10 groups, deciles. Then they bought one month at the money straddles on the top. Decile the stocks with the most upward sloping IVPS. At the money, meaning the strike price is close to the current stock price. Correct. And simultaneously, they sold short an equal amount of those same one month ATM straddles. But for the bottom, decile the stocks with the flattest or most downward sloping IVPS. And just repeat that every month. Month after month. They also mentioned holding the options to maturity and using a 10 day window for trading to help manage liquidity further. They estimated the capacity around $140 million. Okay, the million dollar question, or maybe the $140 million question, how did it perform? What were the results? The results looked pretty good on the surface. A return risk ratio of 1.41, the average annual return was 9.78%. Not bad. And the risk, worst month. Worst month was down negative 2.76%. Seems quite contained. But you mentioned focusing on downsides earlier. What about the worst overall drawdown? Yes. That's where it gets interesting. The worst peak to trough drawdown was negative 8.47%. Okay, 8.5%. When did that happen? This is key. It occurred between November 2008 and April 2011. 
right through the global financial crisis and its immediate aftermath. Wow. So even a strategy designed around volatility can get hit hard during extreme market stress. That's a really important downside to highlight. Absolutely. It shows that no strategy is immune. Despite that, the paper notes it had positive returns in 19 out of the 20 years studied. But that 2008-2011 period is a serious caveat. Definitely a reminder that even statistically robust strategies can face prolonged, difficult periods. Okay, let's shift gears to the second strategy, the filtered put selling. Right. This one's different. The goal here is to collect premiums by selling out-of-the-money put options on the SP500 index itself. Index options. Okay, so not individual stocks, but the whole SP500 index, like the Dow or NASDAQ, are indices, and these settle in cash, right? Correct. Cash settled. They reference the SIBO SP500 put right index, ticker PUT, as a sort of benchmark. That index involves selling one month at the money puts, and it is historically done pretty well compared to just holding the SP500. But the strategy wasn't selling at the money puts, it was out of the money, and it had a filter. Exactly. Selling OTM puts, which is generally seen as a bit less risky than ATM. Yeah. And the crucial part is the filter they used, the absorption ratio. Absorption ratio. Okay, what does that measure? It's a measure of market fragility, basically. Technically, it's the percentage of the variation in U.S. stock returns. They used MSCI U.S. sector indexes that can be explained by the first few principal components or eigenvectors. Whoa. Okay. So like how much the market is moving together in a correlated way. Sort of. Yeah. But critically, they used the change in the absorption ratio month over month. A higher shift or increase in the AR suggests the market is becoming more fragile, more susceptible to shocks. Higher AR shift equals more fragile market. The rationale is that selling puts, especially short dated OTM puts, can be a source of attractive returns, capturing that volatility risk premium. But it's risky, especially in market downturns. Right. If the market tanks, the puts you sold can end up deep in the money and cause big losses. Precisely. So the absorption ratio filter is there to try and mitigate that. The idea is to scale back or completely exit the put selling position when the market looks fragile, according to the AR. Reducing risk exactly when you need to most. Makes sense. How was this one implemented? They used SPX index option data, calculated the absorption ratio change at the end of each month. If the AR shift was low or negative, let's say below a threshold, they used one in the paper. Indicating a resilient market, they would sell a front month OTM put option with just five days left until expiration. Only five days. Very short term. Very short term. If the market stayed above the puts strike price by expiration, they kept the premium. Profit. If the FTX fell below the strike, they'd have a loss calculated based on the difference. And what if the absorption ratio signaled fragility? What if the AR shift was high? Then they simply cleared the position. They didn't sell any puts for that period. They stayed out of the market. Okay. Liquidity-wise, SPX options are huge, right? Very liquid. Extremely liquid. And again, holding to maturity, trading over just three business days helps. The estimated capacity for this one was much higher, around $450 million. So the results, how did the filter impact performance, especially the drawdown? This is where the filter really showed its value. Without the AR filter, the strategy had a return risk of 1.22. With the filter, it dropped slightly to 1.08. Okay, slightly lower risk adjusted return. What about the raw return? Annual return with the filter was 9.64%. Pretty similar to the straddle strategy, actually. But the drawdown, that must be the key comparison. Huge difference. Without the AR filter, the strategy suffered a massive worst drawdown of negative 42.19%. 42%. Yeah, really painful. But with the absorption ratio filter switching the strategy off during fragile periods, the worst drawdown improved dramatically to negative 16.34%. Okay, negative 16% is still a big hit, but it's vastly better than a negative 42%. That filter really seems to cut off the tail risk. It does appear to significantly mitigate that left tail risk. The worst month and the worst drawdown for the filtered strategy both occurred in August 2015 during that flash crash event. So even with the filter, a sharp, sudden drop like August 2015 still resulted in a significant loss over 16% in a single month. Another potential downside example. Exactly. The filter helps, but it's not a magic bullet. Sudden, sharp declines can still hurt. The filtered strategy had positive returns in 17 out of the 20 years. Okay, so two distinct strategies, both aiming at volatility in different ways, both with decent historical returns, but also clear potential downsides, especially during crises or sharp drops. What about combining them? Right, the paper explored that too, using portfolio construction techniques, specifically equal risk contribution, or ERC. ERC, how does that work? 
It's a way to weight different assets or strategies in a portfolio so that each one contributes equally to the overall portfolio risk. You look at the volatility of each strategy and, importantly, the correlation between them. So you're not trying to predict returns, just balance the risk contribution from each part. Exactly. That's one of its main appeals. No need for notoriously difficult expected return forecasts. You just use historical volatility and correlation, typically over a look-back period. How did they apply it here? They combined the straddle strategy and the filtered put-selling strategy using ERC. Although, for the first 24 months, they just used equal weighting before switching to ERC, measuring risk based on the prior 24 months of returns on a rolling basis. And did combining them help? Were they diversified? They found a slightly negative correlation between the two strategies, negative 0.0566, which is good for diversification. Yeah, you want things that don't move perfectly together. Right, and the ERC portfolio reflected this. The annual volatility dropped from around 6.8% and 7.8% for the individual strategies, down to just 5.08% for the combined ERC portfolio. Lower volatility, what about the return and the overall risk profile? The combined ERC portfolio delivered a return risk ratio of 1.92, better than either strategy individually. Okay, that looks like a solid improvement. But the drawdown, did diversification eliminate the big drops? It helped, but didn't eliminate them. The worst month for the combined portfolio was negative 7.76%, and the worst drawdown was negative 10.24%, occurring between November 2018 and December 2019. Interesting. So lower than the put strategy's worst drawdown, slightly worse than the straddle strategy's worst drawdown, but occurring in a different period entirely. Correct. It highlights that even diversified portfolios can experience significant drawdowns during specific market conditions. Diversification helps manage risk, but it doesn't make it disappear. And they added one more layer of risk management on top of the ERC portfolio? Yes, Constant Proportion Portfolio Insurance, or CPPI. The CPPI. What's the idea behind that? It's a dynamic hedging technique. Basically, you set a floor value for your portfolio, say 90% of its starting value that you don't want to fall below. Then you calculate the cushion, which is the amount your portfolio is currently above that floor. Okay, floor and cushion. Then what? You invest a multiple, say, three or four times the cushion amount into the risky asset, in this case, the ERC portfolio of the two strategies. The rest goes into safe assets, like T-bills. So if the cushion grows, you invest more in the strategies. Right. You leverage up your exposure to the strategies when they're doing well and your cushion is large. But if the portfolio value drops and the cushion shrinks, you reduce your exposure to the strategies, putting more into T-bills. And if you hit the floor? If the portfolio value drops to the floor level, the CPPI mechanism dictates you move everything into the safe asset, the T-bills, to protect that floor value. So it aims to lock in a minimum value while still allowing upside participation. What effect did adding CPPI have here? It further improved the maximum drawdown of the ERC portfolio, reducing it from that negative 10.24% down to negative 8.16%. Okay, another layer of downside protection. But presumably, that protection comes at some cost, like maybe giving up some upside potential during strong rallies because you're not fully invested. That's the typical trade-off with CPPI, yes. It can create cash drag if the market recovers sharply after you've de-risked or if you get whipsawed by volatility. The paper focused on the drawdown reduction, though. So wrapping this all up, we looked at two quite distinct volatility trading strategies, one based on the term structure slope for individual stocks. The long short straddle strategy, yeah. Betting on mean reversion and volatility expectations. And the other selling index puts, but using the absorption ratio at a filter to step aside during fragile markets. Mm -hmm. The filtered OTM put selling, aiming to harvest premium while mitigating tail risk. We saw their individual performance, the theory behind them, and importantly, those potential downsides, the significant drawdowns each experienced, albeit in different market environments. And then how combining them using equal risk contribution offered diversification benefits, lowering volatility, and improving the risk-adjusted return, though still subject to its own drawdowns. Finally, adding CPPI as another layer to potentially limit the worst-case losses, but likely with some trade-offs. A pretty comprehensive look at designing and managing risk in these kinds of quantitative strategies. Definitely. It really highlights the complexity involved. So here's something to think about. 
Considering these sophisticated strategies and the multi-layered risk management approaches like ERC and CPPI, what role do you think these quantitative methods truly play in navigating market complexities? And perhaps more importantly, what are the inherent limitations we should always keep in mind when relying on such systems, especially given those drawdown examples we discussed? That's the crucial question, isn't it? How much can the models capture and what remains fundamentally uncertain or unpredictable? Food for thought. 